hello and good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jessica Zavala, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you on behalf of the Coordinating Centers of Excellence to today's webinar, A Suicide Prevention Strategy Facilitating Critical Connections During Times of Transitions. And now I'd like to introduce our first presenter for today, Dr. Danielle Hupp. Senior Consultant and Trainer for Family-Based Services in the Best Center. So without further ado, Dr. Hub. Thanks so much, Jessica, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here today and appreciate you all joining us for this critically important topic. Um, as Jessica mentioned, I'm a Senior Consultant for Family-Based Services at the Best Center at Neomed and also a clinical psychologist. And today I'll primarily be talking about the role of loved ones during times of transition. So I wanna start off today's webinar by framing why it's so important that you've all joined us today because we really all can play a role either directly or indirectly in preventing suicide. And today, hopefully you'll leave with some ideas of what to look for, what to do, and what programming and interventions are available to you and how you can pass that information on to others. So although most of us have an interest in learning what role we can play when we're helping somebody at risk for suicide, um, a 2015 poll found that only actually about half of us feel prepared to step in. And this is for a couple of different reasons. Um, some of the barriers that were identified were a fear of doing or saying the wrong thing, making a situation worse, um, or not knowing what to do next if you start to engage with somebody who is at risk for suicide. And a 2018 poll found that um, nearly 80% of Americans, however, are interested in learning what they can do to help somebody at risk, but they need more additional information and guidance on how to help. So, you know, we're hoping that that's what um, you get from today's webinar is knowing what next. So our goals today are really threefold. We want to discuss the prevalence of suicide and suicide risk during critical transitions, as well as understand the importance of fostering connections during these times um, as a way to reduce suicide risk. And we want to identify a few programs um, through our centers that help to promote connection during critical transitions. So let's start by talking about a couple groups who are at high risk for suicide. So we know that those living with a mental illness are at risk for suicide, but 78 to 80% of those who die by suicide have a co-occurring mental illness and substance use disorder. And that risk increases even more um, when more than one mental illness or substance dis disorder um, has been diagnosed. But we also know that the suicide risk is particularly high during times of transition, which are the things that we're gonna highlight today. So we're going to be talking about three different points in time during today's talk. Um, one, discharge from psychiatric hospitalization. Um, when somebody is returning to the community from a prison setting or jail setting, and also from that time from youth to young adulthood. So before we can really understand our role preventing suicide or assisting during points of critical transition, you know, I think sometimes it's helpful to take a step back and, and go back to basics. And some of you may have heard about psychologist Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, it's been around since the early 40s, um, and it's pretty simple, pretty basic. But I think the message still rings true that it demonstrates that this need for connectedness to others um, comes only after meeting our physiological needs and our security needs. You know, it's something that's shared amongst us all, but that need for connectedness um, is especially high during times of trans transition, times of stress, and it can be really a powerful tool to, to um, be proactive or preventative about um, mental health and other uh, significant health conditions. So we know that connectedness is a shared human need. Um, and I kind of want to talk a little bit about the power that comes along with that. And it really is a powerful mechanism. You know, social support can lead to increased resiliency to suicide, decreased likelihood of a lifetime suicide attempt, but also decreasing thoughts or ideation about suicide. Um, but it also indirectly reduces the risk by increasing positive protective factors, things like self-esteem, and also building up resources for coping. If you think about an individual who's feeling a little better about themselves, more positive about themselves, have people around them encouraging them, supporting them, they're more likely to believe that they can make it through those difficult or stressful times in their lives. So when we as mental health providers, loved ones, officers, those working with the co uh, college population, anybody who's joining us on the call today, when we work together, we really can work to save lives um, during these transitions in, in a number of different ways. And a few are just building connections across various settings, you know, working together. Um, and this requires a great deal of ongoing and open communication between systems. 
decreasing those disconnects and those gaps between our systems. Um, again, forward, forward thinking, planning ahead, all of those things that we have to be diligent about when we're trying to keep people safe who are moving from one system to another. And also engaging loved ones, engaging each other, other community supports to wrap around that person who is at risk. So today, these are some of the programs we're gonna be taking a look at, and I figured we would start with the transition from psychiatric hospitalization to outpatient care. So as I mentioned, one of those critical transitions that can put people who are already at risk for suicide at even higher risk is when they're being discharged from a psychiatric hospitalization. So we know that those individuals who have a history of suicidality, they're 200 to 300 times at greater risk within that first month following a hospitalization um, as they're moving into outpatient treatment. And this is, risk is especially high during that first week of discharge. But discharge is inevitable, and it really could be an excellent first step towards recovery. So what can we do to make the transition easier, safer, more successful? And one of those things that we can do is involve support system and loved ones in planful and very informed ways. So we know that involving supports in, in informed and planful ways works because there have been decades of literature that demonstrate this. Um, we know that when family members or friends who are knowledgeable, appropriately supportive, when they're engaged with loved ones, living with a serious mental health condition, outcomes improve. And not just outcomes for that individual, but for the whole, whole support system as well. So for example, you see things like improved family well-being, improved family relationships and social functioning. Um, you also see the individual being more adherent to treatment recommendations, which obviously leads to fewer um, psychiatric symptoms and results in decreased likelihood for relapse and rehospitalization. And it's really important that as you move forward in your work and with the populations with, who are, with whom you serve, um, that you remind yourself that whatever impacts that individual impacts that system in which they're involved or in which they live and vice versa. So what's something available in the community that addresses this transition from inpatient to outpatient treatments? And so I'm glad you asked. Um, so in the Cleveland area, the Best Center is preparing to launch what we call the LINK program. It's loved ones involved in a network of care. And it's a short-term psychoeducation and engagement program really geared towards those living with schizophrenia spectrum disorders, bipolar disorders, major depressive disorders, and their loved ones. Um, and that's really the key ingredient is to get their loved ones involved during the inpatient stay. It um, assists providers, individuals, and loved ones during this transition. Um, and offers practical information and support. So uh, engagement in LINK really does seek to foster connection, preparedness, and most importantly, hope. You know, we want to make sure that there is no gap between inpatient and outpatient services where loved ones aren't able to be contacted. We want to ensure that there's a warm handoff happening from an inpatient setting to outpatient care, um, ensuring that everybody's on the same page, knowing what to expect, thinking ahead about what roadblocks we might come up against, um, and then getting family members, loved ones, friends involved in problem solving and planning ahead about what those roadblocks just might be. Um, and the goals of LINK are to provide uh, resources, access, information of plan, and hope for individuals and their loved ones living with these serious mental health conditions. So what can you do um, as participants on today's webinar? Um, to help loved ones understand the role that they play. And I think that given the importance of and power of social support, especially during times of critical transitions, you know, what you can do, where can you go for information and what you need to look out for. Um, these are some of the basic tips to, to consider and to think about. You know, first it's really helping under, loved ones understand that they have a role in keeping their loved ones safe and providing loved ones with that practical information, um, but also providing emotional support and resources for those loved ones um, themselves. I think it's, that's critically important. Um, if, we're, if they're not feeling healthy, if they're not feeling safe, if they're not feeling secure, it's very difficult for them to know how to support their loved one who is struggling with thoughts of suicide. Um, and also making sure loved ones know what to expect. You know, it's important we know and we share the warning signs and risk factors to watch out for, and we'll take a look at those in a couple of slides. But we also want to underscore the importance um, for family members to not leave the individual alone during a crisis if there is an active plan for suicide. Helping family members know who to call or where to get help. And this includes things like um, when you're calling 911, be sure to ask the dispatcher for a crisis intervention team trained officer who is a law enforcement officer with specialized training and responding to mental health crises. You know, that's a very impactful thing, very practical information that not a lot of families have access to. Um, 
recognize that there's an instabil instability that comes with times during transitions and identify ways to connect with individuals to connect individuals with programs or activities that help to increase that structure or routine that's been lost. Um, and then also helping um, loved ones identify need and roadblocks and how they can be actively engaged in planning ahead and problem solving to overcome some of the barriers that they might face when somebody's returning to the community or returning to home, things like um, housing, transportation, childcare, things of that nature. So on this slide, there's a few more tips that come from a really great guide that I wanted to highlight, and it's called It's Time to Talk About It, A Family Guide for Youth Suicide Prevention. It's a bit of a misnomer because I think it's got really great information for our populations outside of just youth. And we'll be sure to include um, a link to this guide in the chat box so you can click on it directly. Um, but it's a great resource written for loved ones, telling individuals and family members what to look for and what actions to take. Things like, you know, in, encouraging the person to seek treatment and then follow the recommendations that are made and how to be supportive during those times. Um, helping loved ones understand how important it is to watch for changes in behavior or mood states, or if a significant event has happened in somebody's life and how to be vigilant without being hypervigilant. You know, it's a very delicate balance. Also working with family members and loved ones to encourage open and frequent communication. You know, it's a very scary thing if you feel like you're going to say the wrong thing and that's gonna make the situation worse. And a lot of families and loved ones will tiptoe around um, an idea without asking questions directly, feeling like they don't want to sort of open Pandora's box. And so letting them know that asking direct questions, you know, are you thinking about hurting yourself, that that's a safe thing to do. Giving the individual a chance to talk, having family members express their concern and desire to help, and also giving that person hope and letting them as family members know that you're going to be there for them. These are all helpful tips for families. So as I mentioned on, on, on the slide just before, um, and I won't go over these in detail, but I wanted to highlight some, a couple of slides from the um, that guidebook. I think this is a really great graphic that gives you some common warning signs to look out for. This is information that you can pass along to loved ones um, and share with others. You know, it includes things like, you know, a warning sign for suicide might be feeling isolated or alone, engaging in self-harm or risky behaviors drastic changes in mood, poor self-esteem, and so on, things of that nature. And also there are risk factors. So what are some of the things to be aware of? Um, um, including things like a history of mental illness or substance use, recent major life events, including change in one's life or one's circumstance. And so again, these are, can be found in that guide and really great information to pass along to others that you work with. So we've talked a lot already today about the role of social support, including that transition from inpatient to outpatient care. So next up, let's learn more about the transition back to the community from prison, which is one of those major life events um, or transitions that puts people at risk for suicide. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Jenny O'Donnell. She's our, the Forensic Director and CEO of the Forensic Evaluation Center, as well as a consultant for the Criminal Justice Coordinating Center of Excellence. And today, She's gonna be providing some really great information to us about the transition to community reentry from prison, as well as risk factors of suicide during this time. So Jenny. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Hupp. The, now the, that's great info. You uh, make this piece really easy to build on what you've already provided. Okay, well, let's get started and talk about why reentry population. Um, you might think that all those folks leaving prison and jail are just elated to leave that setting and um, everything's just gonna be hunky-dory. But that's not what the research tells us and it's not what my practical experience has found either. Um, there's a study out of Washington State where they evaluated uh, the residents in their community as well as folks leaving uh, prison and jail and they found them to be, uh, the reentry folks are 3.5 times higher than other state residents to uh, die within the first several weeks of uh, their release. So, and there are some other studies uh, in other countries and, and around the world. In some places, there's a Swedish study that says it's 18 times more likely for someone leaving prison or jail to die within the first couple of weeks. So, so that's why this is a really important population for us to look at. I do wanna say in our next slide, um, what are the causes of re post reentry deaths? And they're not all suicide. I don't want you to hear that, that, that it's all only suicide. But if you look at the identified causes of death, 
you'll see that actually suicide and risk-taking behavior is involved in a lot of the causes. Uh, overdose, obviously we could talk about whether an overdose is an accidental death or a suicide, um, and certainly homicide and suicide, uh, particularly with gun-related violence, is something that we have to be very aware of. But also there's cardiac arrest. Um, that's a very high cause of death in this population. And some of that is drug related. Some of it is due to poor medical care, either in the institutions or when someone comes out and back into the community. And we know for ourselves, if you have physical pain or medical complications, that clouds your judgment all the way around. You, you change your priorities to address that. The other one on here, uh, actually, well, so cancer is number four, and cancer is as prevalent in the reentry population as it is in the general population. And so clearly that's something that's going to cause quite a bit of difficulty for a transition. And then the last one, motor vehicle accidents, we all know is related to usually to substance abuse, uh, risk-taking behaviors. But when we look on the right-hand side, we see the underlying causes. And I think these are really important to note. Um, drug intolerance caused by periods of abstinence or limited access to drugs. And then re-entering into a community that maybe is not so uh, pro-social and not helpful. Uh, we talk about homelessness, limited access to healthcare, certainly limited access to psychiatric and medical uh, medication refills really causes a lot of stress. When we think about what, what are the underlying causes of uh, this increased likelihood of death and suicidality, what the main thing that I know about the population is that they are leaving a very structured setting to going into a very unstructured setting. And for most of them, that unstructured setting, which we think of as the community, is a very dangerous world to this population. Um, if you can look at this list on the right hand side, you'll see that there are a lot of factors that go into the instability that these folks face, including how do I get from the prison I've, or jail I've just been released from, how do I get literally, physically to my next safe place, transportation issues, housing, all that stuff really contributes. Uh, note the one on the bottom, the last one, the psychotic disorders. Folks with severe mental illness are not necessarily at a higher risk of suicide, but when you couple psychotic disorders with substance abuse and transition, as uh, Dr. Hupp mentioned, you really are laying the groundwork for uh, some re really serious risk of suicide. What I'd like us to take away from here today is that as a community, can we create a solid landing? Can we help these folks feel like they're not free falling back into the community, but actually they're um, being reintegrated into the community. Okay, so um, one of the things we need to know about this group of folks is their self-esteem and their self-worth. They have been hearing for their entire time of incarceration and likely for quite a few t years before that, that, that they have a problem, that they are broken. And there's quite a bit of research that talks about the self-stigmatization, but also that can come from the rest of the community. Reporting requirements, being treated as, as if they have done something horrific, and maybe they have, right? But being treated that way also contributes to uh, suicidal thinking and suicidal ideation. So what tools do we need to be ready for these folks? And I, I want to emphasize this, that we need to pre-prepare. We need to be trained as um, community, community residents, uh, community professionals. Whatever our profession is, law enforcement, um, psychology, counseling, we need to be ready and plan, planning to help with our specific set of tools. So the most important thing I can tell you here is to find the tools that you are comfortable using. The other thing is, is that there's a lot of opportunity for interaction here. Collaborate across resources to find what works for you. Know who your local go-to uh, resources are. There was a great question in the chat. Is there CIT um, in every county? You know, I don't know the answer about every county, but I sure know the answer about the counties that I'm in. And so find out what's available to you in your profession in any, in any, uh, 
in your region. So the, the, the piece that you want to be thinking about from, a, from an infrastructure of intervention is how do I go about this? And the first piece is, first of all, what you're doing exactly today. You're getting educated. Is there a prevalence? Is there a need for me to know about this? And I'm going to emphatically say, yes, there is. So the next step is, how do, how do you, in whatever profession you're in, um, how, do you get, uh, how do you get to the crux of the problem? And as an assessment expert, I'm going to tell you, you assess the situation. And we all do this in, in some way or shape or form. But I liked what Danelle said earlier, we have to ask about suicidal ideation and suicidal thinking in plain language. Are you thinking of harming yourself or killing yourself? You need to practice saying that as an individual. You need, because that's not an easy statement to say, right? I say it every day in my assessments, but I don't say it every day to my friends. And I just want to pause for a second here and share with you, just because we're professionals and we've trained and we're thinking about this stuff doesn't mean we're going to be 100% successful. I lost a very dear friend to suicide. I'm a highly trained professional. She came to me the day before. We had this long heart-to-heart -heart talk. It never dawned on me that this was crossing her mind. And yeah, do I still feel guilty about missing that? I certainly do. But the reality of it is I could not have prevented it. So I want you to take that piece with you too. All we're asking you here is for you to be thinking about these things and training. So the next piece, so you're doing your assessment and you're listening really hard, right? Listening skills are really important. And you wanna to talk to this individual in the moment that you're with them. You wanna help them develop a safety plan for now. And I mean now for five minutes from now, now for 24 hours from now, even 72 hours. So that could mean you're checking for weapons or access to weapons. You're explaining to them that you are there to help them out of this current really high, highly stressful situation that they're in, whatever it is, you know, maybe you got called in for a DV call or um, you're, you're there because there was an accident related that triggers this person emotionally. You also want to ask them who can you help them contact or who can you contact to help support them. You're making a connection to support. Maybe you feel comfortable enough asking them in the moment, you know, what are their reasons for living? One of my questions, a friend laughs at me, I, I like the magic wand question, you know, if I could fix everything for you right now, what is the first thing you'd want fixed and why? It gets them talking, it gets them thinking future, it gets them problem solving, it helps you get a little more information. Now, the next piece is crucial, right, is to get crisis professionals involved who can form these strong therapeutic alliances and coping skills and things like that. It's much more complicated than just, you know, giving them a popsicle. But you know what? Sometimes a cool drink or a warm drink or just a, a gentle hand on their back is enough to transmit care and concern. The last piece is always use practical language. And as you're learning these things, you want to look for practical language and CBT or uh, cognitive behavioral therapy techniques, because what you're trying to do is decrease anxiety and stress. So now, um, like I said, the call comes in as a general disturbance or maybe a DV. It's not going to be identified as a possible suicide situation. But what are the things you're going to be listening for and looking for in, in, in whatever profession you're in? These are the keys here on the, on the right-hand side, these bullets. You're looking for hopelessness, right? In my last slide, I talked about future thinking. People who are hopeless are not future thinking unless they're really planning for this moment. They're stockpiling a weapon or other things. Like I keep thinking about my friend, right? So if people are talking about suicide or ending it, that's a big key. They're talking about feeling trapped or in unbearable pain or a burden, or maybe they're socially isolating completely. It could be these extreme mood swings. There's a lot of factors that go into this, but these are all red flags. Okay. Now, I, next slide please, I am a hopeful person. So I'm going to make sure you leave here with a few tools, right? First of all, the first one is you're doing it today. You're starting prior to this, to this encounter. 
And I mean, our systems need to start prior. They need to start in the prisons and in the jails. Is there stable and appropriate available housing? When is this person going to get their first in, uh, financial influx? Who will they call and reach out to? Who is their support team? We also want to connect them to things that will give them a sense of purpose and hope and engagement in their community and positive future-oriented planning. Next slide, please. So one more little recap, right? We want to recognize the risk factors. There's the transition difficulties. There's maybe the prior suicide attempts. Alcohol and drug abuse is an interaction that is, is very volatile. But we want to also address this with warm handoffs to um, competent and engaged services in the community as well as support systems. We want to empower these guys. I had a guy who called me, he's 24 hours out, and I said, how was your sleep last night? And he said it was really bad. And I said, how come? He said, because I'm afraid of the dark. And I paused and I said, turn the light on. And he said, I didn't think I could. We want to give these guys the tools that they need to develop success slowly and in measurable steps that they can see and that are relevant to them. On the next slide are a couple of examples. So help them define and de deliver on relevant, obtainable, personal accomplishments. Keep the communication going between all these, factor these, these groups on the left side but incorporate the individual to find success in everyday tasks that they can build on. I'd be happy to take any of your questions and I appreciate you listening to me today, but I'm really proud to, to, to announce our next speakers, Jessica Zavala and Russell Spieth. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. O'Donnell and Dr. Hupp for that very informative information that you presented. Um, I have the pleasure today of talking about reducing suicide risk among college age individuals. And before I actually get into that information, I just want to briefly talk about the Ohio Program for Campus Safety and Mental Health and our program. Uh, what we do is we take a three pronged approach to mental health promotion. And part of that includes our approach with our collaborative program development grants in which we provide funding that supports a variety of activities on campus, including gatekeeper trainings, depression screening, and mental health awareness programs. We also provide education and training. And so throughout the academic year, we offer a number of trainings on topics of interest um, to the campus community and evidence-based training, such as behavior intervention teams, violence and suicide prevention, and best practices in postvention. And then finally, technical assistance in which we collaborate with national, state, and local experts to leverage training and deliver te technical support, again, to promote campus mental health and mental enhanced um, wellness. Part of that approach also includes a, a public health approach to suicide in which we collaborate with our campus partners to focus on student success. And so that includes promote, promoting help-seeking behaviors and providing services. So we uh, partner with them to provide access to mental health service, uh, services. Also preparedness, which can include training, again, for behavioral health intervention teams, and also plans for postvention. And speaking of postvention plans, I think it's also important to reference Ohio House Bill 28 as a resource. House Bill 28 was signed into law in 2015, requiring public higher education institutions to develop and implement a policy to advise students and staff on suicide prevention programs. And so essentially what that does is that it requires Ohio higher education public institutions to provide students access to crisis intervention, um, engage in mental health programming, the use of multimedia platforms to connect students to resources, and then also have, again, postvention plans for incidents that impact the campus and college community. And so thank you, Dr. Hutt, for sharing the 2015 poll data in which uh, it was found that almost 50% of Americans identified barriers that stopped them from trying to, to help someone at risk for suicide, but there are also barriers for college students as well. 
And compared to older adults, the 18 to 24 year old age group also shows the lowest rate of, of help seeking behaviors. And when it comes to prevalence, we also know that the prevalence of suicidal thoughts is significantly higher among young adults, um, age 18 to 29 years old. And suicide, of course, is the second leading cause of death among college students, claiming the lives of, of 1,100 students um, each year. Also, according to the data, we know that 6% of undergraduates and then 4% of graduate students seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year. Nearly half of each group did not tell anyone. However, I'll say this, um, it's not all grim. It's not an end all be all when it comes to the prevalence of suicide among college age students, especially as we talk about the power of connections and the power of being connected. Um, according to the data, we know that 67% of students did tell a friend or do tell a friend that they're feeling suicidal before telling anyone else. And we also know that students are 20% more likely to receive treatment on campuses that are perceived to be supportive of mental health issues than those that are not. So again, a key piece is that we know students are connected to their peers, and we also know that campuses that are perceived to be supportive, that there's certainly some hope within those. So when it comes to trends in, in college students' mental health, I think it's important to note that the increase in challenges with student mental health did not just begin recently. This is not a new phenomenon. In fact, according to the 2018 annual report of the Center for Collegiate Mental Health at Pennsylvania State University, between the fall of 2009 and the spring of 2015, the use of college and university counseling centers increased by an average of 30 to 40 percent while enrollment really only increased by 5%. And, and also what we're hearing from many experts um, is that we really may just be at the tipping point when it comes to stressors for college um, student mental health, certainly during the COVID-19 pandemic and certainly post um, COVID-19, we know that we're gonna be seeing some significant stress producers. And also, as we know, all of these stress producers, these all represent a significant transition in a young person's life. Um, let's also talk briefly um, about risk factors. And according to the Trevor Project, there are three factors that can impact risk. Um, those factors are factors of the mind and body, factors from the environment, and then also experiential factors. And so when it comes to factors of the mind and body, are there history or is there a history of signs of depression? Is there a history of mental illness? Any history of being abused or mistreated? Perhaps even a history of self-injury or self-injurious behavior. And when it comes to factors of the environment, are there barriers to mental health services on campus or in the community, within the campus community? Um, are there factors such as academic or familial crisis, a family crisis that may be happening? and then certainly increasing tuition and financial aid or any other academic concerns. And then when it comes to experiential factors, I'll just mention, um, are the students engaging in risky health behaviors? Are they engaging in substance abuse or other unsafe practices? Could there perhaps be a lack of support from others or difficulty in school, failing grades or any other academic concerns? When it comes to the college populations that are at the highest risk or at the most risk. Uh, we know according to the data that that includes males, international students, LGBTQ students, and then students with pre-existing mental health disorders as well as returning um, veterans. And speaking of student veterans, according to the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs, we know that veterans accounted for 18 percent of all deaths by suicide among U.S. adults. And in 2014, um, the rates of suicide were the highest among younger veterans, and those are the ones that are between ages 18 through 29. And so I just talked about risk factors and who is at risk and what stressors can be contributing to their risk. It is also ever more important to talk about protective factors. And we know by definition, protective factors are characteristics associated with a lower likelihood of negative outcomes or that reduce a risk factor's impact. And we also know that protective factors 
may also be seen as a positive countering event. And so I'll also say, if you're familiar with SAMHSA's strategic prevention framework, we know that effective prevention focuses on reducing those risk factors and strengthening protective factors that are most closely related to the problem being addressed. Um, Dr. Spieth is gonna, he's gonna actually share some specific examples of what we're doing here at Neomet, but I just wanna own in and highlight uh, when it does come to protective factors that a sense of belonging, you know, is your campus inclusive enough? And also campus-wide public education on mental health and stigma reduction are really key. And so the studies suggest that students who feel as though they belong, those students tend to seek out and use campus resources to a greater extent, and which we know can further their success. Also, we know that a sense of belonging can buffer, very well may buffer students from stress and thus improve their mental health. And when it comes to outreach programs, we know that programs offered can educate students on how to recognize symptoms of mental illness, um, how to seek care, what options are available to support friends that may be experiencing mental health challenges. So when it comes to elements of quality programs, there are really two action words that come to mind and what I refer to as the two C's, collaboration and communication. And as I mentioned, one of the key approaches to our program includes our partnerships with colleges and universities as well as community entities such as NAMI, um, local behavioral health boards, and then also law enforcement. And so when it comes to off-campus re referrals, our uh, many grant partnerships have been instrumental in connecting students to off-campus re referrals, especially for those campuses that may not have an on-site on counseling center. We also know that through these many grants um, that nearly 90,000 have been exposed to suicide prevention awareness messages and then about 5,500 individuals from institutions of higher education and community agencies have been trained in gatekeeper trainings, such as mental health first aid, uh, QPR, question persuade, refer, um, cognito, and other best practices across the state. So before I turn it over to Dr. Spieth, I just wanted to briefly mention that there are a number of excellent resources. And if we are looking at programs with a STEM-based approach, um, then it's really vital that the behavior and these resources encourage help-seeking behaviors. Um, also, they, that they promote counseling service, services. It, there all should, should be uh, visibility on campuses and a promotion of community resources and outreach events, certainly advocacy for an internal recording system, prevention, intervention, and postvention plans. Um, certainly the use of modern technology, um, robust counseling websites, and many, many other resources that should be included. And then when it comes to language, certainly we want to focus on innate strengths. And we know that language and thoughts influence perceptions, right? And so there certainly should be a component of modeling healthy language. And so uh, versus saying that an individual committed suicide, we can say that that individual died by suicide. And versus saying that an individual is a problem, we may say that they have a mental health challenge. Um, certainly using mental wellness when appropriate, refraining from using um, inappropriate terms or other words, and certainly the use of first person language is also key as we think about elements of quality programs. And so I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Speak, who will share some more examples. Thank you so much, Ms. Zavala, I appreciate that. Um, another element of a quality program is leadership to promote mental health and suicide prevention. So some really interesting examples of this are um, having people that students really look up to um, that share their own experiences with mental health struggles and recovery and, and getting better from mental health issues or having contemplated suicide and, and how they um, uh, address that issue and came back to be successful um, people who can give back to the students. So those type of things are really, really helpful. And we try and have panels with physicians and pharmacists at Neomed because we're a medical school and the students always find that to be one of the most impactful uh, experiences they have is to see people they look up to who will discuss their own process of overcoming struggle. Uh, so also, you know, clearly it's important across all of these interventions we've discussed because 
to think about sort of the cultural impact of those experiences. One of the questions I always think about when I hear about an evidence-based practice or I hear about a, um, a best practice is evidence-based or best for whom, right, which is a pretty important question. Um, this is a model um, that's been generating some buzz in the academic literature, the culturally engaging campus environment model. It essentially looks at ways to help, if you think about it, uh, just like society as a whole, uh, campuses are incredibly diverse. We have international students, um, we have sexual minority students, uh, racial minority students, uh, a, a, a rich diversity of folks. So you really have to think about to what degree is your programming and your environment um, uh, helping people feel connected, which is a big challenge, obviously. So it kind of breaks up this model, um, those, those factors into two elements, cultural relevance, and that's the degree in which the, the environment really is relevant to people with different cultural backgrounds and, and identities. So, you know, we talk about the gatekeeper training, suicide prevention training. An example of that would be having, for example, um, folks uh, who are prominent LGBTQ students and faculty being the folks who maybe deliver that to the LGBTQ support group. It's kind of an example of that. Cultural responsiveness is the degree to which the environment is responsive to, responsive to the needs of, of diverse individuals. So Jessica mentioned veterans a moment ago, which is part of the reason why there's been this big trend in really trying to have um, veterans at the table and creating program on campuses to better meet their needs. Um, so you have veterans at the table discussing what are the gaps, what are the issues, why do I feel connected, why don't I, and then creating programming to support that. And obviously that, gener that could generalize across race, student athletes, all kinds of different groups where they're at the table helping inform programming and help people understand how best to meet their needs. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about care teams. Um, Je Jessica also uh, referred to them as behavioral intervention teams. There's a bunch of different names. We actually at Neomed used to call them behavioral intervention teams. And the students um, told us that, it, that that term for them kind of scared them. And again, you're thinking about medical students and pharmacy students and graduate study students who are um, really pursuing a career and, and, and can be concerned about how they're perceived. Uh, so we changed the name to care team, which is they found to be much um, more acceptable. Um, so again, that's an example of reaching out to the people that you're trying to, to, in, uh, to engage and get their perspective on what you're doing. Um, but essentially they're, they're multidisciplinary groups and their, and their purpose is to support uh, students, employees, faculty on a campus to essentially prevent um, a, a bad mental health outcome. So a suicide, a homicide, or someone who leaves school because of mental health distress. So it's essentially its goal is to help people get the needs, get their needs met before there's an outcome um, that, that, that none of us want to see. And a really good resource for this is the National Behavioral Intervention Team Association website. There's lots of free resources there. And I'm talking about care teams in the context of higher education. However, the care teams have been used in a lot of other organizations. Um, so really, this is a, an, inter, an intervention that could generalize across, across different organizations. Um, so it, it essentially tracks concerns over time. So I'll give you kind of an example. So our care team is, is, and is really deliberate. We try and have people on the team who have relationships with students and employees because the name of the game really is people who have relationships with folks. Um, so an example of, of how it would work would be uh, the chief of police, I'm gonna shout her out, Chief Mianski, Kyle Mianski, who's fantastic at Neomed. Um, let's, her team, let's say, um, is aware of a student um, uh, risk of suicide and gets that student to the hospital for inpatient hospitalization. Callie would then, Chief Mianski would then contact, or she's part of the care team, she would let us know that this happened with this individual. As a group, then we would think about, okay, who has a relationship with this student already? What's really nice is we've constructed a care team. While it's not perfect, we're always trying to get better. It's pretty easy typically to find somebody like from student services or um, a faculty member who already has a relationship with that student. That person that would reach out to that student at, at best when they're still in the hospital, find out what their needs are, find out how they can help them out, find out what they, you know, um, what, what kind of concerns they have. Typically in the academic setting, that has a lot to do with I'm missing class, I'm missing tests, I'm so, like, this is just getting worse. Um, so we'll try and alleviate that and, and 
and help them begin to navigate that process of coming back and meeting their academic needs. So then that student will come back, will at that point have determined with that student's input, what's the best way to support them over time. And obviously in concert with the hospital staff too. Um, and and if, if, if family is involved, we do try and involve family or, or significant others, which is allowed in FERPA if you're concerned about someone's well-being. Um, so essentially trying to get a team together um, and help this person, student transition from being hospitalized to back into the neomed community or the higher, edu higher education community. Um, and then kind of tracking that person over time. So you know, we'll be checking in, again, the person with the relationship with that student will be checking in, seeing if they're following up with their, with their mental health psychiatric treatment, see how things are going academically, but basically just be a support and be optimistic. Um, and then at a certain point, the best time is when a student is at a point where it seems like there's just hasn't been a concern for some period of time, seems like they're doing pretty well. And then we no longer um, follow that person and, 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 and have other people that we're, we're considering at that point. So that's kind of an example of a care team. Um, uh, we find them to be really reassuring for everybody here. And we do a lot of orientation with the students and the employees regularly to discuss the team, discuss what we do. And we really want the students to get to know us um, and have relationships with us and appreciate that what we're doing is, is to provide um, hope and, and, and support and not to be punitive. And I'll just say really quick, um, it is really important, again, that people who are in leadership um, discuss their own um, struggles. And uh, I do this with the students a lot, and it's interesting, and employees, and how much they come out. I seriously thought about suicide back in 1994 when I was a college student. And there weren't really care teams back then, but this ragtag group of folks um, basically reached out to me. Um, and I would say I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. And that was a group of students. It was one faculty member. And it was someone in the lab who I had a relationship with. It's so powerful to have a group of people reach out to you and, and basically just say, I'll walk this walk with you. I'll be here to the degree you want me to. Um, and it, it's a, a very powerful, uh, very powerful intervention. And yeah, now I'm, I'm kick it back over uh, to Dr. Hupp to bring us home. Thank you, Dr. Hupp. Thanks, Dr. Spies. So, you know, that was a great presentation. Thank you all. Um, and so, you know, we had an opportunity to hear a lot about the risk related to this college age population. So I think it's really important that we touch on a program that's geared towards individuals who are primarily in this age group who are also experiencing a first episode of psychosis. So as mentioned, you know, first episode psychosis often occurs during the early teen years or early adulthood when there are lots of changes going on in a person's life. So, so many firsts happening at this time. If you think back um, to when you were that age, you know, you're moving away, you're engaging in relationships, possibly trying substances for the first time, starting college or work, you get a taste of independence, which often comes with a lack of structure or lack of routine, which we know is something that is a risk factor. And so individuals often come to these early serious mental illness programs from other transitions with high suicide risk, like hospital, psychiatric hospitalization, school or college, criminal justice system. So we know that a significant portion of individuals living with um, schizophrenia will die by suicide, five to 10% of those individuals. And that risk is even greater during the first episode of the illness, especially during three specific points in time. So during what we call the prodromal phase, so as psychosis is first emerging, um, right before, right after a hospitalization, and then several months following symptom remission. So, you know, it seems sort of um, confusing because it's like somebody's symptoms are remitting, they're feeling better, they're starting to get back to their lives, but sometimes it's, that, it's at, at that stage where they realize, you know, what they've just gone through, what's happened in their lives, and, and so that can be a risk for suicide as well. So what can be done to intervene for these young individuals experiencing a first episode of psychosis? Well, there's a treatment program through the BEST Center that we call FIRST. Um, it's FIRST Coordinated Specialty Care for First Episode Psychosis. Um, and it's a team-based integrated care program for individuals experiencing a first episode and their loved ones. It has lots of wraparound services, you know, individual counseling, family work, psychiatric care, case management, supported employment and education. We're really encouraging people to keep on living and get back to their lives. Um, there are 13 of these programs or teams around the state of Ohio, and they're led by our consultant trainers from Best Center, both um, Nick Dunlap and Crystal Donovan. And first fosters connections because the individual in treatment and their loved ones have access to a number of treatment team members for an extended period of time. And part of this 
protocol is routine assessment for suicide risk. So we've heard a lot about critical points or transitions, what puts certain individuals at risk for suicide, key factors that cut across interventions today might include some things like knowing what to look for and appreciating the increased risk of suicide during these transitions, minimizing gaps in treatment by facilitating those warm handoffs, making sure somebody knows where they're going and making sure those providers or their loved ones know what to expect restoring or replacing that structure or that connection that's often lost during transitions, and then offering tools and resources and practical information that can really empower people to promote mental well-being and reduce that risk of suicide. Ultimately, you know, we have to remember that fostering, facilitating, and encouraging connections during times of transition is really an effective strategy to help people, to help keep people safe and reduce suicide risk. So on these next few slides are some excellent resources that we wanted to be sure to highlight. So including the guide that I had mentioned a couple times earlier with warning signs um, and risk factors, how um, information about contacting, um, what to say to a dispatcher when asking for a CIT trained officer, a law enforcement toolkit, as well as some help in crisis numbers and crisis lines that are really great to always have on hand and available to others. We also wanted you to know where you can learn more about our first episode programs um, throughout the state by visiting the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services webpage. And if you have any interest in learning more about the programming that's available through Neomed's Coordinating Centers of Excellence um, that were highlighted today, or maybe other programs we have available in our centers um, that we didn't have an opportunity to discuss, please be sure to reach out to our Executive Director, Ruth Samara. If you are in law enforcement and using this as part of your training opportunity using this webinar, um, be sure to email Haley Farver um, and provide the code OhioCIT in that email. So we wanna thank you all again for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for today's webinar. If you do have a question that we didn't get to or something comes up or comes to mind later, please be sure to reach us uh, out to us anytime at the email address above. Um, we'll go ahead and scroll through a couple of slides that just note the references used for today's presentation. So thank you all again, and Dr. Speed, on to you. All right, I think that's about it, y'all. Um, feel free again that you can send us questions at the Best Center at neomed.edu. Those will be filtered to the right person and we'll get back to you. Bye, y'all, thank you. Thanks for joining us so much, we appreciate it. And uh, my colleagues, this was really fun. Uh, nice to work with you. Yes, thanks for joining everyone. It was great having a chance to chat with you all today. Thank you. Bye.